What is up? Good Mike Work Commentaries back at you with episode 460. I am your host, Greg Morgan, coming up here very late with your Hell in the Cell results and reaction video. I did give you guys a warning in my predictions video that I had to work on Sunday. I was not home to see Hell in the Cell live. It's the first time in a long time I have not been able to be home to watch a WWE pay-per-view. But unfortunately, my situation at work, there was something going on where my presence was absolutely required and there was no getting out of it. I had to work a 14-hour day on Sunday, which drove me crazy because I'm used to sitting home, getting a six-pack, watching the pay-per-view, live-tweeting with all of you, and uploading a reaction video at the end of the show. But this work situation, my stupid career, uh, threw a monkey wrench in all my plans, so I knew it was going to be sometime Monday afternoon until I got a video up to you. Now, I'm hoping this will come to you before Monday Night Raw airs. It should. Uh, and as far as Raw goes, I'm not going to be able to be home for that either. I have to work again tonight, so I'm going to miss Raw live. No live tweeting for me either. Uh, but as far as this week's episode goes, episode 461, your Raw and SmackDown review, that will be up at normal time, late Wednesday, early Thursday. I know in the past couple of weeks, my schedule has been a little bit off. Some of my commentaries have been delayed a day or two, and then my This Day in History last week caused a delay in my Raw and SmackDown review. So things have just been a little bit funny. It's a combination of my special videos and my work schedule that's kind of throwing everything for a loop. But things should start settling down this week, and I'll be up here as normal with episode 461 in just a couple of days. As far as tonight goes, like I said, I'm here to give you some pretty quick thoughts on Hell in the Cell. I thought the show was very good, a really good show. I couldn't wait to get home. I didn't even get home until midnight my time on Sunday night, and I live in California. So I wasn't able to really take an accurate look at the pay-per-view until then. While I was at work, I did have it pulled up on my phone and took a look at it from time to time, and a lot of you were tweeting me updates, and I appreciate that. But I wasn't able to sit down and really watch this pay-per-view until very late at night. So watched it all last night, jotted down some notes, and here I am to give you my thoughts on it. Uh, Hell in the Cell came to us from Detroit, Michigan in the brand new Little Caesars Arena. I was really excited to see this new building because I'm a Detroit native. I was born there, lived there for the first few years of my life, and I'm still very loyal to all of the sports teams there. Um, I'm a climate guy. I always live in the south. I always live near water, and I always live where it's warm. So I will never in a million years move back to Michigan but I was still born there, and I'm still very loyal to all of the teams. So I was really excited to see Little Caesars Arena, where the Detroit Pistons and the Detroit Red Wings will be playing their basketball and hockey games, and they're going to be sharing that arena. Very sad to see the Palace and Joe Louis Arena go, but uh, times change, and sometimes you need a better arena in a better part of town. And this place looked pretty awesome. And how about that LED ceiling? How many arenas are doing that? That looked really good during Hell in the Cell. Whatever's going on there on the roof of that arena, it looked awesome. It looked like they had some lights and some screens up there and the whole overall setup uh, looked very good. I liked the atmosphere and I liked the way everything looked. Uh, as far as the results go, like I said, this was a nine match card, one on the kickoff and eight on the main card. The only match I did not see in its entirety was the kickoff match. Didn't even look at it at all. But according to the results that I've read, it does look like Shelton Benjamin and Chad Gable did defeat the Hype Bros. No surprise there. I predicted that match correctly. They've been teasing a split between the Hype Bros for quite some time. And now I would assume that we're going to see that sooner rather than later. Uh, as far as the main card goes, they opened up with the tag team match. Usos versus New Day inside the Hell in the Cell. And this match delivered to every degree that we were hoping it would. I mentioned in my predictions video, even though I predicted this match incorrectly, the one thing I did predict correctly is that it would steal the show, and it would probably be the best match on the card. And as per usual with these two teams, they did not disappoint. I cannot thank the Usos and the New Day enough for this incredible program. Every single match they've had for the tag team titles has been a show stealer. It's to the point where I'm not even sick of seeing them wrestle because now with the Usos regaining the titles in this match, it, the feud's not over. The New Day is going to get another title match. Normally when feuds like this drag on and they keep going and they keep going, the fans hate it, they get bored with it, they're ready for something else. But if we have to have another match between the Usos and the New Day, I don't care. I'm not going to complain. And those two teams are the only good thing about that SmackDown tag team division right now. And it's really a two-team division. And they're having a long run here. And the Usos, and when it's all said and done, are going to be a very decorated tag team in WWE. And so is the New Day. The match itself, like I said, was incredible. And the two teams stayed inside the cage. I had made mention in my predictions video that possibly that third member of the New Day, whoever is on the outside of the ring, turned out to be Kofi, Xavier, and Big E wrestled the match. I was like, the third one's probably going to find a way to get in there, and it's going to be three on two. But they kept it all inside the cage, which is good, because if you're going to have two Hell in the Cell matches, you don't want the combatants getting out in both matches, because then what's the point of the cell 
if in every single one that you have, they get out. So I'm glad that they kept it all in the cage because you knew that Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon were going to be everywhere. That was pretty much spoiled when they announced that it's a Falls Count Anywhere match. So with the Usos and the New Day, I was happy to see that they kept everything inside the cage, and it was great. They had some really cool spots and some innovative stuff that we've never seen before in this Hell in the Cell. I loved it when they pinned one of the Usos in the corner with the kendo sticks, and they were uh, sliding the kendo sticks through the holes in the cage, and they basically pinned him right in the corner, and then just had free reign to do whatever they wanted with him. I really liked that. They also handcuffed Xavier Woods and tied him up to the ring post, uh, the way Kane did to Shane McMahon all those years ago when he electrified his nuts with a car battery. Remember that? They kind of did the same thing with Xavier Woods there. He's hung up on the ring post, hanging on the outside of the ring, and they are just wearing him out with kendo sticks. It was fucking awesome. I like the finish, too, because Xavier Woods wasn't able to get the handcuffs off. He had to wrestle the rest of the match with those cuffs on. Eventually, the Usos get Big E in the ring. They nail their double splash finisher on him. And out of nowhere, Xavier comes flying in from the left of the screen to make the save there with the handcuffs on, barely saving the tag team titles. But eventually, they dispose of him, get Big E back in there again, hit him with another one of their finishers, and get the 1-2-3 for the pinfall and become the new SmackDown Tag Team Champion. So, uh, the Usos and the New day like I said continue to set the world on fire in the tag team division and they did a great job uh this is a situation like I said I'm not even mad about uh the hot potatoing of the belt you know these guys are flopping it back and forth a lot and they're working a lot together but the quality of the matches are so good that I don't care I might normally get a little bit annoyed with something like this, but I have so much motherfucking respect for these two teams and how great they've worked together that I really don't care what they do, and I'm dazzled by everything. So good job, big props to the New Day and the Usos. An incredible program so far. Looks like it's not over quite yet. I don't know if we're going to have one more match now, maybe a blow-off. I think the next pay-per-view for SmackDown is Survivor Series. Is there one in between? Shit, there might be. I don't know. But I guess we're going to get at least one more match between the two. And if it was up to me at this point, I hope that the Usos just retain and go on another run. I love seeing New Day as tag team champions, but... You never know. I mean, there's been talk of splitting up the New Day forever. And I wasn't sure if WWE wanted to break them up and move Big E onto a singles run or if they want to keep them together and create one of the most decorated tag teams in WWE history. But I think they also have that with the Usos. I'm such a big fan of their new look and their heel turn that they did a while back. Uh, they're so much better now. They're so much more believable. They're awesome on the mic. I dare say that the Usos are just as good as New Day on the mic because New Day, as we've seen, can get a little bit silly. Their act does grow grow a little bit tiring. It does get old sometimes, and sometimes the jokes are just a little bit too silly and a little bit too stupid, uh, but at the end of the day, they're all still very entertaining on the mic, but the Usos, I think I might like just a little bit better. The way they talk trash in the ring, and they rap, and they do all this stuff, they just have a great look, and I like them as heels a hell of a lot more than I like them as baby faces. Uh, we then had Randy Orton versus Rusev, and as happy as I was after that Hell in the Cell, uh, my happiness turned to sorrow because, unfortunately, every day will not be Happy Rusev Day. Uh, Rusev at least gave Randy Orton more than 10 seconds this time. I think they went about 12 minutes or so. And it was a pretty good match, too. And it was a good finish. Uh, Rusev did something really cool. Randy Orton had Rusev set up for an RKO, and he, and he lands down on the mat to do that stalking viper-type thing where he's coiling up, getting ready to nail the RKO. And Rusev grabs him by the arms, flips over, and gets him right into accolade position. And Randy Orton is then able to counter that and hit an RKO. So it was a nice, good finishing sequence there. I did like it. Randy Orton got the pin and the victory, which sucks because I love Rusev, and I wanted every day to be happy Rusev day, but at least this wasn't a squash, and the match, I think, was good enough for me to, you know, I can let it go. You know, I know Randy Orton is probably going to beat Rusev. I predicted this match incorrectly as well. I was 0 for 2 right off the bat here on the main card, predicting the tag team match and Orton and Rusev wrong. I don't know if this feud is over or not. It probably is now. There's really no reason to continue it unless they just want to continue to make Rusev look bad, but... I uh, really wish they would move Rusev on to something a little bit more significant. And just watching Jinder Mahal with that WWE title, I'm saying to myself, why the fuck is Rusev not the WWE champion? I got nothing against Jinder Mahal, but Rusev is a lot better than Jinder in the ring and on the mic and just overall in general. And if you want to give a new guy an opportunity, why not Rusev? What the hell is going on here? So anyway, that match uh, was what it was. Baron Corbin 
won the United States title. This is a match that I did predict correctly, although it did turn out to be a triple threat. I mentioned that in my predictions, that after Ty Dillinger beat Baron Corbin on SmackDown Clean, that they might insert him into the U.S. title match, and they did. I think it was on the kickoff show, Ty Dillinger approached Daniel Bryan, and they both kind of took turns doing the yes chant and the 10 chant. I thought that was really cute. And Daniel Bryan eventually agreed and said, yes, you have a good point, Ty Dillinger. You're in this match now. It's a triple threat, and go out there and kick some ass. I had a feeling Baron Corbin might win the title because if he were to lose here, I didn't know where he went from here. Especially when you look just to a couple months ago, he was the Money in the Bank briefcase holder. He was penciled in to be world champion one day, and then his whole world came crumbling down around him. So I didn't know what they were going to do with him if he were to lose this match. So inserting Ty Dillinger into it I thought was a good idea. The match was good. AJ Styles, as usual, kicked ass out there, hit a picture-perfect 450 splash, and an awesome, phenomenal forearm on Ty Dillinger. And then Baron Corbin, right after that, runs in the ring, kicks AJ out of the ring, and scores the pinfall on a beaten Ty who had just taken the forearm from AJ. So he kind of went in there and stole the title, which was awesome. And uh, good for Baron Corbin. Now he's got something to do. Now he can continue having matches with Ty Dillinger and AJ Styles. I'm sure will stay in the mix. He'll probably get a rematch right away on SmackDown, most likely. And so will Ty Dillinger at some point. So I don't know if AJ is going to regain this belt back and continue his U.S. title run down the line or if this is it for him. And he's going to move on to another feud, another program once he wraps up business with Baron Corbin. As much as I love AJ as the U.S. champ, I would love to see AJ get in the world title mix. Natalia also retained her title, although she lost, being DQ'd after using a chair on Charlotte's leg. I think she was injuring and working Charlotte's leg throughout the match. Uh, Charlotte falls on the outside of the ring. Natalia follows her out there, grabs a steel chair, and starts beating the shit out of Charlotte with it, and she gets disqualified and retains the title. So I predicted Natty holding onto the belt correctly. I didn't think she would lose it, but I also think I predicted her to win, and she didn't. She lost via DQ. So technically, I got that match wrong as well. Uh, after that, we saw another Fashion Files segment. That made its return. Pretty funny stuff. Uh, Brizongo was in the office there or whatever, trying to close the case on 2B or whatever. And then the Ascension comes in wearing disguises and hands them a, a tube, 2B. And they open it up, and it's just a sign, I think, that says the Ascension wants to be their friends. And then Brizongo goes on to insult the Ascension. And then the Ascension takes off the disguises, and they look very dejected, very sad. And their feelings are hurt. The Brizongo made fun of them. And they said, geez, guys, you could have just said no. And they walked away with their heads down, and it was a very sad segment. I definitely shed a tear over that. I feel bad for the Ascension. But all in all, a pretty funny skit there. Jinder Mahal took on Shinsuke Nakamura next. As expected, this match was not the main event on the card. I don't think any of us really thought that it would be. And Jinder won. He actually retained the title. The Singh brothers were all involved at first, constantly getting in the middle of this match. Charles Robinson eventually throws them out. And then right after that, uh, I think uh, Jinder escapes or ducks out of the way of a charge by Nakamura. He hits the ring post, and then Jinder hits him with his finisher and gets the pin and retains the WWE title. So that might be it there. It's a shame that we didn't get to see Nakamura win the WWE title, but I mentioned in my predictions video that if this match fell in the beginning of the card, I didn't want him to win. It's not the stage for him to win. Nakamura is a pretty over-talent, especially with the internet fans and, and people like that, and I would love to see Shinsuke Nakamura get his moment in the main event of a pay-per-view. So they might be wrapped up with this feud here, unless they do one more. They could have a match at Survivor Series, and Shinsuke could win the WWE title at that pay-per-view, or Jinder's done with him, and he's moving on to another opponent. Really not sure what they're doing yet, but that feud really wasn't that interesting. They were doing the same shit every week. It felt like a mid-card feud. I'm over Jinder. I'm sorry. I've said this time and time again that I have nothing but respect for the guy. I'm happy for his opportunity. I'm glad that he's finally getting a chance to succeed in WWE and become a major player, become a top star, become a champion, become a top contender. But it's just not working out. Apparently, they do have some big India tour coming up. So maybe after that, they can think about taking the title off of Jinder. But, you know, some people have been talking about WrestleMania. I can't imagine Jinder staying champion that long. But if you're going to put the belt on somebody that was previously a jobber, the only way really to make them stay on top of the card once they lose the belt is to give them a long run. Jinder might need to hold the belt until WrestleMania if WWE wants to keep him as a top star. Otherwise, if he drops it next month or something, Jinder is going to be right back to the middle of the card. So they might have to keep the title on Jinder for a little while just for the sake of their investment. 
And like I said, I don't know who he's going to work with next. I don't know if anybody does. Uh, he might continue his program with Nakamura. If that's the case, then I think Nakamura might actually win the title because Jinder's escaped the last two title matches with Nakamura. It seems like uh, Jinder should get what's coming to him eventually, and maybe Shinsuke can knock him off. But if not, it looks like uh, Jinder might move on to a completely different opponent, and he could hold on to that belt indefinitely. So I'm ready for him to lose it. I think the Jinder experiment uh, was a failure overall. I applaud the WWE for trying, giving a guy an opportunity, but it really hasn't worked since it started. And if it was up to me, if it was up to this WWE fan, I would pull the plug on this shit as soon as possible. So I guess we'll find out on SmackDown a little bit more about the world title situation and where they're going to go with that in the future. Uh, the next match was another match that I predicted correctly in more ways than one. A lot of you guys were giving me credit on Twitter for predicting Dolph Ziggler coming out to no music. To me, that kind of seemed obvious. The way he was talking about the greatest entrance. If you guys think you've seen great things from me so far, you have seen nothing yet. Tune into Hell in the Cell on Sunday to see exactly what I do and to see the greatest entrance you'll ever see. And I mentioned in my predictions video that they should have him come out to nothing. I went a couple of steps further. I said, bring, bring out the old microphone from Madison Square Garden back in the 70s and 80s that, that came down and was lowered from the ceiling. Have Howard Finkel do a cameo and announce Dolph Ziggler to the ring, announcing his hometown and his weight. And that's it with no music and dim lights and all of that stuff. They almost did it. And as a matter of fact, they even played Dolph Ziggler's music. It started to play and then it went out. And then the lights went out and you just had a completely blank Titantron, dark arena, and Dolph walking to the ring with absolutely no music. So I thought that was cool. I had a feeling that he would do that. And I'm glad that he did that. Maybe he'll do that every week now on SmackDown. He'll just walk to the ring. Only a couple of guys in recent history have done this. You know, everybody has theme music now. You have to go all the way back to the late or early 80s to find people without theme music. But in recent history, I think uh, Vladimir Kozlov came out to no music for a little while, and R-Truth might have back in 2011 when he was a heel as well. But uh, other than that, no guys just walked to the ring with nothing. So I like that Ziggler did that. He did lose to Bobby Roode. And it was a nice finishing sequence there where there were several reversals. I think uh, Ziggler tried to roll up Bobby Roode and had a handful of tights. Roode countered that, rolled up Ziggler with a handful of tights, and Ziggler countered again. And then Roode countered again and got the three count by holding Dolph Ziggler's tights. And immediately after the finish, Ziggler hit Bobby Roode with the zigzag and got the last laugh. So it's pretty obvious that these guys will have another match in the very near future, probably on SmackDown this week or maybe the week after or whatever. So... That's the deal there. Main event time now. Kevin Owens versus Shane McMahon inside the Hell in the Cell. And because of my predictions coming up kind of late this week, I completely forgot to mention one person and one wild card that was so obvious in this. And a lot of people were tweeting me, predicting this. Hey, how about in Hell in the Cell if Sami Zayn turns heel? Because when you look at what's been going on on TV, first of all, Sami Zayn's not even booked or has any presence at all on the Hell in the Cell card. And when he's been interacting with Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon lately, he hasn't looked very good. Even Shane McMahon, when he approached him on SmackDown last week and tried to warn him about Kevin Owens, hey, be careful, I've never seen this look in his eye before, he can be very dangerous, be careful out there. And Shane McMahon basically told him to fuck off. He's like, don't worry about me, I, got, I can handle it. You know, Just worry about yourself and I'll worry about myself. Basically just blowing off Sammy's advice. Sammy's just trying to do a good deed, warn his boss about his nutcase of a friend that's going to be very dangerous and, and could potentially injure him very badly at Hell in the Cell. And Shane McMahon doesn't want to hear it and treats Sami Zayn like a pile of crap. So in my predictions video, I meant to mention Sami Zayn and I never did because a lot of you were. A lot of you were pitching the idea of Sami Zayn turning heel and I completely forgot to bring it up. I predicted that Shane McMahon would win this match because I thought that Shane McMahon has lost too many matches. Every time he's on the card, he loses and I think they needed to change it up this time. And since it was a false Count Anywhere match, I thought Shane could do something crazy where he dives off the cell or gets creative and finds a way to pin Kevin Owens somewhere in the arena. And I thought maybe they would change this up. But the more you thought about it, the Sami Zayn heel turn wasn't really a shock. I mean, it was an awesome swerve. I liked it. I liked the fact that Sami Zayn turned heel. But at the end, I wasn't really surprised that it happened because when you look at what's been going on on TV, it's kind of obvious. The match, you know, it was exactly what we expected. They did all sorts of stuff. Uh, Shane, inside the ring, gave uh, Kevin Owens the Van Terminator or the Shane Terminator or whatever the hell he calls it when he jumps across the ring and kicks the trash can into his face. And what was interesting about that spot is that after that, Shane McMahon went for the pin and Kevin Owens' foot was on the ropes and the referee stopped the count. 
And I remember seeing that. I'm like, what the fuck? And luckily, Corey Graves speaks up and says, hey, I don't know if that was even legal. I think the referee got caught up in the moment here. If it's a Falls Count Anywhere match, your foot can be on anything that it wants. What if they wound up in the concessions area and Owens has Shane McMahon pinned down and then Shane puts his foot on the popcorn machine? You don't stop the count for that. Eventually, they did find their way outside of the cage. We knew that they would. Shane McMahon demands that the door be open. They say no. He goes under the ring and gets bolt cutters and cuts the chains off and gets outside of the cage. They're fighting all over the arena. They both climb up to the top, and they have a pretty long match on top of that cell, which every time I watch one of these matches and I watch the guys work up there, it makes me so fucking nervous. They are backdropping each other, body slamming each other on this mesh cage, and I'm like, I hope that holds up, because it's not like the old cage. You know, the old cage wasn't uh, wasn't as high up as this one is, and I even think it extended around the ring further than it does now. I think there's a little bit less room to move out there. So the Hell in the Cell itself, the structure itself, has evolved a lot over the years. And I know that this apparatus is very well reinforced. It's probably not going to give way, but Kevin Owens is not a small man. And when he's taking backdrops on that thing, uh, my heart kind of skips a beat there for a minute. They find their way up and down the cage. At one point, Kevin Owens has Shane McMahon laid on the announce table, and he's about to jump off the barricade onto him. And that's when Owens looks up at the cage and says, I'm going to climb this motherfucker. And he climbs all the way up there. And it's funny now, you notice they have those, like, footholds in the cage. They've got all throughout the entire cell, around the whole thing, they've got little cutouts to where you can put your feet in and climb up rather easily because otherwise it'd be very hard to scale the cage. And back in the old days of Hell in the Cell, the first ones 20 years ago, they didn't have those little holes. You just had to climb up on your own. So they make it very easy now for the guys to climb up there. And especially a guy like Kevin Owens, you know, he's kind of a beefier guy. It's kind of hard for him to scale up there, but he did it. He did it with no problem. And then Shane McMahon ends up following him up when Kevin Owens just cannot find the courage to dive off the cage. He teased it. I thought he was going to do it. I really thought he was going to jump off of the top and land on Shane on the announce table, but he just couldn't do it. Shane finally gets off the announce table and climbs up there himself, and that's where they start fighting. And then they start coming down the cage. Now they're climbing down. Kevin Owens is trying to get away. And then Kevin Owens took a bump that I was a little bit more comfortable with him taking. Uh, He kind of took the same bump that Dean and Seth did a couple of years ago when they kind of went like halfway down the cell. Shane McMahon follows him down. They're both standing on that middle bar, and Shane is punching and kicking at Kevin Owens. Finally, Kevin Owens loses his grip, falls backwards, and lands right through the announce table in a pretty sick little bump there. Shane McMahon then jumps down, grabs Kevin Owens' lifeless carcass, and lays it on the other announce table, and then he looks up to the top. And we knew we were going to get something like this. We knew Shane was going to do this crazy, insane dive which I think is nuts. Whether or not that table is gimmicked or not, how he can dive off of there like that in his mid-40s and not be killed, I have no idea. Shane McMahon's completely out of his mind. I can see it for WrestleMania, risking your life for a big spot on a memorable show, but for him to also do it here, I was pretty surprised. And Shane McMahon climbs up there again, gets to the top, looks down at Kevin Owens, and just as he's about to jump, right when he jumps, Sami Zayn out of nowhere, who's kind of kneeling down at ringside there. He's in plain sight, but everybody's focused on Shane McMahon. They're all looking at him. I didn't even see Sami Zayn down there. And as soon as Shane starts to jump, Sami Zayn grabs Kevin Owens, pulls him out of the way in the nick of time. You talk about timing. I mean, damn. A half a second longer and Shane would have landed on Kevin Owens. I mean, he got out of the way with no time to spare. Shane McMahon goes crashing through the table and the EMTs run out and the doctors surround him immediately and all the referees They go get a backboard and a stretcher, and they start putting the neck brace and shit on him. They're trying to get them all ready to be wheeled into an ambulance or something. And then Sami Zayn grabs Kevin Owens and drags him over to Shane McMahon, pushes all the referees out of the way, lays Kevin Owens on top of Shane, and makes the referee count one, two, three. So Kevin Owens wins the match. He has help from his longtime friend Sami Zayn. I've been waiting for a Sami Zayn heel turn for a while now. He's not doing shit on SmackDown. Most recently, he's been losing singles matches in the middle of the card to Aiden English and guys like that. And I think he's really run his course as a babyface. And it's going to be interesting to see or hear his explanation on SmackDown as to why he would align himself with his longtime sworn enemy. Yes, they have a friendship. Yes, they have a long history. But as far as WWE goes, these two guys have wanted to kill each other and have even had several very vicious and hardcore matches and a couple of blow-offs even. So their rivalry in WWE is very storied. And so, you know, Sami Zayn now teaming up with Kevin Owens or helping him out, 
I don't know if uh, Sammy learned anything from Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho's friendship. I don't know why anybody would want to be friends with Kevin Owens after what they've seen him do to anybody that he's aligned himself with, but it should be interesting just to see a change for Sami Zayn. Uh, I want to shout out Ryan Satin from Pro Wrestling Sheet. I was reading his Twitter a couple of days ago, and uh, he had tweeted something really funny. The uh, There's an old Jim Carrey movie, you know, came out, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, something like that, Me, Myself, and Irene, where Jim Carrey is just this really nice easygoing, happy-go-lucky guy that's so nice that everybody takes advantage of him. Everybody treats him like shit. Eventually, he snaps. He goes crazy. He creates an alter ego. And all of the years of him being taken advantage of and shit on by everybody has finally taken its toll. And now he's created another personality to let all of these feelings out, all of these frustrations out. And that would be a really good gimmick for Sami Zayn. You know, if he's sitting back there and he's happy Sami Zayn and they do a backstage segment where he's, you know, good guy Sami Zayn, somebody walks over and shits on him and then he turns into evil Sami Zayn. And then he goes out there and is a vicious monster kicking everybody's ass and he's feared. I thought that would have been a really funny idea. And I retweeted him and I was like, that's a fabulous idea. I would love to see them do something like that with Sami Zayn. This might be the next best thing. And it doesn't seem like on the surface Sami Zayn would make a very good heel, but I think that maybe he'll surprise us. And anything better than what he's doing currently, to me, is uh, is an upgrade for Sami Zayn. And I'm looking forward to seeing what he will do and how his alliance with Kevin Owens is going to work. I don't know if this is going to be a permanent alliance, if they're going to have each other's backs from here on out, or if it was Sami Zayn just doing the heel turn, you know, helping out his former friend Kevin Owens and then going on his own separate way as a heel. I have no idea. I'm sure there will be repercussions for this as well. Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon probably might punish Sami Zayn for this. And we've all heard the rumors about Kevin Owens possibly going to Monday Night Raw. And maybe they decide that Shane McMahon and Kevin Owens cannot be on the same show. Or maybe they try to punish Kevin Owens by moving him away from Sami Zayn. So Sami Zayn is on his own. I don't know what they're going to do or if they're even going to move Kevin Owens to Raw. But if they do, they've probably got several ways to do it. I was the one that even mentioned a trade between Raw and SmackDown and sent Owens to Raw and bring Samoa Joe over to SmackDown. I think that would be great. So it should be interesting to watch SmackDown on Tuesday and see the fallout from all of this stuff and where they go in the future with all of these angles. But as far as the pay-per-view itself, Hell in the Cell, I thought it was a very good show. Very little to complain about here. Some of these in-between pay-per-views tend to be throwaway shows or glorified SmackDowns or glorified Raws, uh, but this one was very good. It was a really, really good night of wrestling, and it was fun. Very little to complain about. I'm devastated about Happy Rusev Day. I'm not totally thrilled that Jinder Mahal is still WWE Champion either, but still, overall, when you look at the show as a whole, it was very, very good. So anyway, there you go. There's my thoughts on Hell in the Cell. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I will be up here in just a couple of days with your Raw and SmackDown review. And my commentary schedule hopefully will remain back to normal with no more issues. So anyway, I will talk to you guys in just a couple of days. Until then, peace.